Good morning, everyone. It's that spot just before lunch, isn't it? And it's getting a little slow in the brain for me anyway, usually. Um, so I'm excited to have uh, Caleb talking to us about something uh, kind of a little more fun and exciting and light-hearted in terms of 2D gaming. Um, before we commence, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, I, if you don't mind just make, taking one minute, I, I had the privilege of working at the NCIE and working with some young people um, uh, using uh, technology to build their own games for, uh, to, it, as demonstration of their own culture and exploration of their own culture um, in, with the Indigenous peoples here in Australia. Um, and it was absolutely wonderful to see um, that expression. So um, it, it's, for me, this kind of topic, uh, even though we're looking at the technical aspects of it, has a real uh, life purpose um, that, and meaning that is um, much greater. So I just wanted to share that with you. But uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Caleb to uh, talk to us about 2D gaming using Python. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Are there any professional game developers in the room? Someone pays you to write games. If so, please leave. No, no I'm kidding. So I'm not a professional uh, developer. Um, I'm a software engineer. I'm pretty much a generalist. I jump from topic to topic every couple of years. I tend to do a deep dive, and then I move on to something else. I want to get into 2D gaming as a hobby. Um, and I thought submitting a talk proposal to do that would be a really great way to learn. And indeed, it was a great way to learn, but I also discovered it's actually quite hard. It's quite a difficult domain. I have way too many slides. I think I have 49 slides. And 30 minutes is probably not going to be long enough for that. The cool stuff is all at the end, right? But I can't show you that until I've built a platform with the stuff in the beginning. So I'm going to move quickly through the stuff in the beginning, but the slides will be viewable afterwards through the video and, of course, through my GitHub link that I'm showing there. Um, so I hope you will forgive me if I move a bit too quickly in, in certain places. I've tried really, really hard to make this as accessible as possible. And if you don't understand anything at the end, then that is my fault, not yours. So let's begin. My goal was to show you how to build a simple multiplayer game, and I thought that I'd be able to produce a finished thing at the end of 30 minutes. And I tried, I really tried, but that's just not possible. What I can do, the best I can do, is to show you the building blocks, uh, the hard stuff, the, the bits and pieces that you need to get put into your game engine, and then you will have to go the rest of the way. Or perhaps next year I'll try to submit a talk proposal to do, to do this, this next half. About me, um, I'm currently working at PCCW Global. I'm doing network automation. In the past, I've done chemical reactor modeling, um, hotel reservation software. I wrote quite a bit of that for, for several years. I did distillation column design. So like I said, lots of different things. I've made a couple of uh, videos and books for O'Reilly. I did a video course on Cython. All three people that, that watched that thought it was really good. So uh, if you want to learn more about Cython, you can do that. Um, I wrote books. I have some books here. I'll be giving some out during the, the um, course of the talk. These are very difficult books to get. Um, I don't know of any other hard copies. And they're only available on O'Reilly subscription service. So let's get to Python Arcade. Um, probably most of you uh, are aware of Pi Game. I've also uh, dabbled with Pi Game off and on over the years. Nothing serious, very amateurish. But I discovered Python Arcade recently, and I really love the simplicity that this library brings to game development. This is a screenshot from the Read, Me Do the, Read the Docs page for Python Arcade. The author, Paul Craven, really tries hard to make it as accessible as possible. He even has a section, which you can see to the bottom right there, on diversity, diversity for the project. So why Python Arcade? I don't really have time to go through all the bullet points, but there are a couple of nice details that I really like. Python 3 is really great. What I really like about Python Arcade is the examples. The examples are really excellent, and there are many of them. Each example focuses on one particular kind of aspect of games programming, so you can really do a deep dive into a specific kind of game. There are RPG examples, there are platformers, there are gravity-based examples. So if you want to incorporate one of these elements into a game that you're making, you can pretty much just read from the title of the example, um, and there'll be a short snippet of code, maybe 10 or 20 lines, that'll show you how to do just that. You can execute the games. So once you pip install Python Arcade into your, well, pip install Arcade into your um, virtual environment, if you know what the names of the examples are, and you can read them off the previous slide that I gave, you can, you can run them. So here are a couple of examples. So it's a bouncing ball example. So inside the code for this, you'll see how to incorporate gravity into your game. 
Um, and then you get more complex ones where you get like a sprite collection type algorithm. The code for this is maybe 30 lines, right? So it's pretty accessible to get into. And then the last one I have here is the, um, the model that I'm going to be using for the rest of this talk. I already know I'm taking too much time to explain this, but it's fun. So I'm, I'm moving this around with the keyboard, right? So we're going to look at the building blocks for making a game where two players might move around with the keyboard on two separate screens and uh, all of the communication goes to their server. That's, that's really the backdrop for, for this talk. So I'm not going to talk about all of this code. I just wanted to point out that this is an entire uh, example. Uh, I can show you what the example does quickly. Okay, so it's a yellow square and I'm moving it around with a keyboard, right? That's, that's pretty much all it does. But the code sample is complete for that. And I want to draw your attention to the two methods, update and onDraw. What happens is you create an instance of one of these my game objects and the Python Arcade runtime calls into your object with the update method and it provides you the delta time since it last called the update object. So this is what allows you to move things on the screen using, um, using knowledge of the time elapsed so you can make things move with a certain speed. The other one on draw is when it calls you to draw something on the screen. And just keep that in mind for the rest of this talk is that changing the position of your, of your game objects is separate to drawing them on the screen, right? Those are, not, those are not coupled. And that's very important because in the multiplayer system that we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna do a client server system where the server is gonna calculate the position of the game objects. But the drawing of those objects is gonna happen in the client application. Okay, so let's move along. I've got some utilities here. Look at them after the talk. It's a diversion from the, from the core message, but it's very handy. The tip is, uh, try as soon as possible to use a vector class. Don't work with X and Y manually in all of your uh, events and event handlers. Um, it saves a huge amount of time to begin with vectors early. So you can look at the previous slide um, later when you watch this back. For example, um, there's a normalized function that you get with the vector class that comes out of PyMonk. And it makes it much easier to correct for diagonal movement. Here, the blue square doesn't have the correction. So if you calculate which keys are currently being pressed uh, and you blindly add left and right together, you get too much diagonal side movement. This is a very common problem whenever you start on games programming. To try to correct that is a pain, but if you use a vector class, you can just use handy methods like these, the normalized function, and that problem goes away. But I digress. I have a couple of um, copies of my book here, and I thought it would be fun uh, to try to identify certain games. I have a screenshot from three games, one for each, and each uses a different network model behind the game's engine. Um, I'll start in that column, and then I'll go to the middle column, and then go to the right column, and I'll ask uh, what game is the screenshot of, and the first person who guesses it right will get a book after the talk. Okay, so we'll start on the left column over there. Go. Yes, there we go. You get a book. Now we'll do the middle, middle column. Excellent. You get a book. See me afterwards. Last column. Excellent, you get a book. Well done. <laughs> so what's, what's pretty interesting to me, and when I got into this and started reading up about the, the um, uh, programming models behind how the network models work, it's really fascinating that they're all completely different, utterly different. The first one, Fortnite, uses a client-server model. In this model, the server calculates the entire game logic. It, it determines everything. The key presses that you enter in your, in your game client gets sent to the server and the server calculates what that means and then it sends the game state back to the game clients and they draw them on the screen. The, the lockstep model is completely different to that. Game state is not shared between two StarCraft, two StarCraft players client sessions. The game state is entirely kept separate but a simulation is running in lockstep on each of the client machines. All that they exchange is keyboard input but they never share the game state. And the final one, um, Awesome Noughts, uses a pure peer-to-peer -peer model where your own player's actions are entirely determined on your own machine uh, and then sent to all the other players. Awesome Noughts is quite fascinating, um, and I have an article about that if you look at my slides afterwards um, by Joost van Dongen. He goes into detail about what the ramifications of that are. Anyway, we have to move along. Client-server. There's a server in the middle, and we have client machines around. 
people are playing games on the ones with the screens, but the one in the middle, which is calculating all the game logic, uh, there's no human player present. We need to break this down into um, how we're going to communicate between these clients and the server, right? The first two items here concern what gets sent. We're going to capture player inputs, literally keyboard state, which keys are being pressed, mouse, mouse presses and so on. Those are going to get sent from the client machines across the network to the server. And the second thing that we need to transmit is on the server, after the game state has been updated, we're going to send the game state back from the server to the clients so that the clients can draw that on the screen. And the third point we need to touch on is TCP versus UDP. How am I doing for time? To go. Eight minutes to go or eight minutes elapsed? OK. <laughs> OK, so the first one. I'm using a data class object here. Data classes is new in Python 3.7. You can get it in Python 3.6 if you pip install data classes. It's pretty much just a way of uh, making a very simple class with a couple of of attributes. I'm not going to go into this here, but all this really is, it's a mapping of um, direction keys and whether they are true or false. And this is what we're going to be sending from the client to the server. The second one is what we need to send from the server back to the clients after the game state on the server has been updated. Same thing, we're using data classes. The one that we send is the game state, the one at the bottom that I've highlighted there. Um, but internally, it has a list of player states. So all of the players are going to get all of the player states so that they can each draw um, the other players on the screen. And finally, TCP versus UDP. In games programming, no one really uses TCP. And, and the reason why is quite interesting. It, it's dangerous for me to get into now because it's going to cost me time, but it's worth explaining. TCP is too reliable. You really want the lowest latency possible and it's OK to drop packets in certain situations. It's easy for you to think about that in the context of what I just told you. From the client, we're going to be sending the current state of the keys that are currently pressed. If we lose one of those packets and we're transmitting 30 times a second, does it really matter? It, it doesn't, right? We're not sending a key pressed event that occurred. We're sending the actual state of whether the keys are currently pressed or not. So for a couple of seconds, a key might be true, uh, and then the key pressed the key press state might be false, and then it might be true for another couple of seconds. And if we lose one of those, it doesn't really matter, right? So the cost of TCP reordering and uh, retransmission of drop packets is a cost that we don't need to spend often in games programming. So people always tend to use um, UDP. Unfortunately, UDP is quite a lot of work because um, it's pretty complicated to set up. It has some of its own corner cases that are pretty, pretty different to TCP. And you usually have to build some reliance you have to build some reliability on top of UDP anyway, because there are some things you do want retransmission for. I don't have time to show UDP to you, so instead we're going to stick with TCP, just because it's much faster to, to move. And over and above that, I'm also going to be using zero MQ sockets. Zero MQ sockets, they're a way of cheating with socket programming. They're really, really easy to use. It's really difficult to get stuff wrong. Um, and they automatically handle reconnection and things like that. They also handle distribution models. So for sending from the clients to the single server, we're going to use 0MQ push and pull socket pairs. And then for updating each of the clients from the server, we're going to use a pub sub model. 0MQ provides all this out of the box. And here are two pretty complete examples of functions that you might have, um, long running coroutines that you might start uh, once on the client and one on the server. Um, that wraps all of the zero MQ sockety stuff inside queue management. The one, the, it, the ZMQ push for the client, there's a queue object um, that is provided, and this is a long running task. And what, what the caller does is it simply pushes um, data onto the queue and it'll get sent over zero MQ. And likewise, on the server, you provided a queue socket, and then your client um, function would listen to the queue and wait for things to come off. This, this is pretty much complete. There isn't really much more to, you, to, to doing zero MQ sockets than this. Okay, so this is the most important slide of the entire talk. Because if you can conceptualize this, you could probably make it most of the way on your own. So here's the thing to remember. Here's the thing to, to, to really understand. The three tasks that I've listed here, task A, B, and C, on the one hand, the client has to continually send to the server the state of the current 
input, which keys are pressed, right? Task B is that the client has to continually receive the game state from the server so that the game state can be drawn on the screen. Those two tasks can be run independently, completely independently. They don't really have anything to do with each other. And finally, the task C is draw the game state on the screen. And the reason why I separate that from the other two is because of how the event loops are structured between the game engine and the IO event loop that we'll be using async IO for. And that also can run independently, just like I said right at the start, that the update method and the on draw method um, are separated from each other. On the server, we have the same uh, separation of concerns. The first task of the server is to accept client connections. And because we're using 0MQ, there's very, really very little to say because that's all wrapped internally. So we won't be talking too much about task A on the server side. But tasks B and C, um, task B on the server is a long-lived task that has to receive player input and update the game state. And task C then is to send that game state back to clients. And again, task B and task C can run independently. They, we, we don't need to send the game state out only after it's been updated. We can pretty much run them on a stream, um, each, each independently. So let's begin with the server. Ironically, you might think the server is more complicated. It, it's actually easier, and we'll get to why that is in a minute. This is a main function. I'm not going to go through every single line, but I've just highlighted um, what I've said in the previous slide, which is we have our task A, accepting client connections, completely handled by um, the socket library for us. And then we have task B and task C, which are literally created tasks um, using async IO's um, create task function. And then at the bottom, we wait on all of those tasks for them to finish, which hopefully is never because our game is so fun, no one ever exits. Um, and then the second half of the server code, right? This, this completes the picture pretty much. I've got the implementations for those two tasks. The code reads, reads in a pretty straightforward way. I don't think there's anything really subtle here. So I'm going to skip it and move on. If you, if you can understand what I've said so far at a high level, I think you'll be okay to read the code. So I'm going to keep going. The client code is a lot more complicated, and this is why. We're using async IO, which has an event loop. The event loop wants to control the main thread. So it'll handle all of the socket connections and interleave all of your coroutines and provide time to them for computation. Unfortunately, the game engine also has a loop. It has its own game loop. And most of the game engines work like this. Pygame works like this. And Python Arcade works like this. And there's no real good way currently to share the game loop between the two. So I struggled hard with this. Uh, what is the right thing for me to explain to you? Given that some of you may be beginners, some of you may teach beginners, and what are you going to explain to them? I, I think my opinion that right now, until um, Python Arcade, which is really Piglet under the hood, until Piglet develops support for async IO, probably the least effort solution is to run the async IO loop in its own thread and let the game library um, use the main thread. So that looks like this. Um, I've just shown the main function in our client code. This is analogous to the, to, to the main function that we had in the server code. We create the window, uh, which is the Pi Arcade thing. And then the unusual bit here is we're creating a separate thread. And the thread worker there at the top is how we're creating an async IO event loop that is going to run in, not the main thread, it's going to run in a side thread. Is everyone with me still? Book for you. Very good, very good. OK, so this, this is the IO thread that is running separately to the main thread. It looks very similar to the, to the uh, server code that I showed before. We create our two zero MQ sockets. This time on the client, we have a push socket because we're going to be pushing the keyboard state to the server. And we also have a sub socket, which is going to be, which is subscribing and then going to be receiving the game state, the updated game state from the server. Yeah, you can see there at the bottom in receive game state, the player's position is being updated um, after receiving a message off the socket. And this is the last and final piece of the client code. So we're almost there. What I want to um, really emphasize here is if you look at the update method now, the update and the on draw methods, the on draw method is unchanged towards the bottom third of the screen, but the update method is empty. It's completely empty. Why? 
The reason is because the updates are being done on the server and in our other thread, in our IO thread, we're modifying the client's position there when we receive the updates from the, from the server. I hope that's clear. If you can understand that, you can probably reproduce all of this. It took me a while to get to this point where I conceptually understood that those two things have to be separated in this way. And from here on, it's smooth sailing, right? So I can show a quick demo. The server has to be a separate application, which is a beautiful TK into window there. And here's my client application. So there we go. What's happening here is my keyboard input is being sent to the other process, which is calculating my updated position, sending that position back to this application, my game library, and then it's getting drawn on screen. Yay! How does it look? <laughs> Bit laggy, right? Why is it laggy? It's laggy because my server is sending me updates 10 times a second, right? But we want to draw at 60 frames per second. So we have a problem. How much time do I have? 10 minutes left. OK. It should be enough. This is where the fun stuff begins. This is what I was referring to in the beginning. So end, but not the end. It's pretty laggy, right? This is what we need to do. When we draw the movement on the screen, we have to make up stuff, because we're only getting updates from the server. 10 times a second. You can make the previous demo smoother by receiving updates from the server faster, 20 updates a second, 30 updates a second, 60 updates a second. But if you have 100 players in your game and you're updating at 60 times a second, all of the clients, you very quickly run out of bandwidth. So the solution is not to send updates from the server faster. That, that, that is a, a path that goes nowhere. What you have to do is you have to make up stuff. There are, there are two parts to this. The first part is, you need to predict in your client where you think the next update from the server is going to be coming in terms of position on the screen and at what time. That's the first part. And then the second part is you have to interpolate and draw the animation of your game object from where it is now to where you think it is going to be then when the next update arrives in the future. So I've got a couple of equations here, but the math is pretty simple, really. What you do is you say, I have my current update, and I very cleverly stored the previous update, so I know what the change in position is, and I know what the change in time is, so therefore I can predict, given that the velocity is probably going to be the same, what the position is going to be like in the, free, in the future. So I'm going to step through that quickly. So you get some explicit formulas for the predicted future x, y, and x2. So that's our plan. We're going to store the last two server updates, and we'll use a deke for that, a double-ended queue, so we can keep um, appending values to it, and they'll keep getting popped off, but we'll retain the last two. Um, and then we will calculate the future expected position based on the last two updates, and then we will draw an interpolated position between the two. So this is um, one of the long-lived coroutines inside my client code, uh, where I'm receiving the game state from the server. And the changes that I've made here is a couple of subtle things. I append to my two, two length long deek the new update. I also reset a magical new time variable to zero. And I save the snapshot of where my current player sprite is right now in the client. And then in my update method, which is now no longer empty. It no, it no longer says pass, right? That's what I did before. Now in my update method, I have to draw I have to draw this extrapolated value between where my current sprite is and where I am expecting that it's going to be in the future. And that's pretty much it. If you go back to this code, I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out. I want to show you the demo. So here I've changed the update speed from the server right down to two times a second. It's really, really slow, right? But it's easy to see. I think I still may have the other one open. So I'm just going to start this again. It's very easy to see the prediction working, right? So the black square is the value that I'm getting from the server, which I'm drawing. And the yellow square is my invented value. So this is what the player is going to see. I won't show the black one in my real game, right? So you can see how the yellow square is leading the black square, right? And when I'm moving in straight lines, nice predictable straight lines, I'm guessing correctly. 
the code is, is, is correctly predicting where the next update is going to come and when it's going to come because the black square appears perfectly in the yellow square where I thought it was going to be. It looks much better than that if you increase the speed of the server updates. So here I go back to 10 times a second. So I don't know how clear it is on the big screen, but you'll see that the yellow one is pretty smooth and the black one is the one that's jittery around. So the yellow one really is drawing at 60 frames per second and the black one is still at 10 frames per second. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you, Caleb. We actually do have a little time for questions. Wow. So do you want to take one or two? Or oh, will we I'm leave more it than late? happy. Yeah. And so, uh, people who got their books, come get your books. Yes, yeah. Someone's in the middle there, so I might take that one. Yeah, go. Yep. Ask Just uh, bring the mic to you. Hang on one sec. So would you recommend um, Python Arcade as a framework to use for um, teaching uh, beginners to programming? As a absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, 100%. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, where was that? One up the back. Yep. Um, we teach quite a number of novice computers, uh, uh, computer uh, le learners how to do games. Um, but the good thing about Pygame is that uh, although you want to guide them towards classes as they get more experienced, you can start with just an event loop and deal with sprites right. and not have to worry about classes. Can you still do that in Arcade or do we have to jump in with OOP straight away? I don't know. Um, I think all of the examples, oh, you can, there we go, you can, yes, thank you. <laughs> yep, there's a question at the back there. Yep. <laughs> I actually, I have a couple again. more books if anyone else wants. Um, I want to give them all away, so if you hang around after the questions are done. Have you tried using uh, physical models and Kalman filters to predict movement of the player in the client? Doing this was hard enough, <laughs> so no. Uh, yeah, it's worth, on that point, no, I, I haven't done uh, what you've suggested, but most people don't do linear interpolation. That's kind of interest, interesting. Um, they use um, second order interpolation models um, to handle uh, curvature. So if, if a sprite is moving in a curve, linear interpolation does really badly. The, the, the error is quite visible. Um, that's something that I would like to try as well, but. Linear, linear interpolation was easy for this talk. I actually had one question. Um, it, when you threw up that equation, you said, oh, this is fairly simple math. And for somebody with my brain, I'm an experienced programmer, but terrible at math. Right, right. right. Um, did you find any good resources to bridge that gap, I suppose, between, you know, okay, I've got this, uh, I need to do some interpolation, what should I use and, and how do I implement that? So I'm going to go back to, I do have, these links are really good, the ones that I had in the slide. I wish I could have, is it that one? Yeah, these references are, re are really quite good. They're worth reading. Um, they're not really beginner material, but they do go into some of the math. Um, and they especially talk about how programmers cheat to improve the user experience. That's, that is really interesting to me. Um, there is doing the calculations faithfully according to what math requires, and then there is the, the, the user experience. And they always do whatever they need to do for the user experience. Never, they, they never honor the physics of, of the um, situation. We've got one more over here. Hi, uh, that was interesting. If you took that gravity example that you showed us first, and you said that the game was um, instead of being looking down on the game, you're looking sideways at it, then wouldn't you be able to interpolate using that gravity function? So supposing that the, the sprite needs to be moved in that curvature. That would be even better. So you'd be using a, a real model 
um, to do your interpolation instead of just blindly uh, tracking movement. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a great suggestion. If you have more knowledge about how your objects are going to be moving in the world, then you can improve on the, on the interpolation model. It, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's a really good, good idea. Uh, this will be our last question, I would suggest. We've got about a minute and a half left. Does Arcade have much support, much, provide much help for collision detection? And also, uh, how do you go about teaching the basics of collision detection? So it does have support for collision detection, and it has support for integrating PyMonk for a real physics engine that can also do collision detection. And, and those work fairly well. Um, but if you spoke to someone with more experience in Arcade than I have, they, they may have a different view. But my impression as a, as a newcomer to Arcade um, is that you can do de collision detection. There's, there's some support for it in the game. And there are examples that are really nice. For example, if you have a large world that, has to, that, that you have to scroll through and your window has to move within the confines of the large world, that's really easy to do in, in Python Arcade. It's, um, I can well imagine that um, school kids would have a lot of fun making a huge world of things to collect and being able to just walk their sprite all over the place. That's, that kind of thing is really easy to do. Great. Thank you. Will you join me in uh, thanking Caleb? Okay. And as a small token of our appreciation, you've got the uh, PyCon mic, so thank you, everyone. Um, I think we're off to lunch.